Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. Earlier we had the very official naming. It's always is an official moment. The naming of the new cabinet here in France. 16 ministers will have all the junior secretaries or junior ministers uh, next week uh, with us uh, to talk about it from Brussels. Pierre-Yves Le Bon, Socialist Member of Parliament. Joël garriot melam Conservative Member of the French Senate. We're also in uh, the company of Ludovic Subran, chief economist at credit insurance uh, firm Euler Hermes, and Philip Golub of the American University of Paris. The biggest new name uh, in this uh, cabinet, the return to political grace of 2007, socialist standard bearer for president, Ségolène Royal, the mother of François Hollande's four children. I'm very honored to be put in charge of this difficult and exciting project. And she was indeed all smiles. Before we return to our panel, let's say hello now to Hala Moedine, uh, who is uh, at the helm of our Media Watch segment. I am indeed. Well, I've been taking a look at some of the reaction online, certainly on the Twitter sphere. In France, there's big news with the hashtag reshuffle or remaniement. Uh, here we have one reaction from someone working for the HuffPost in France. They're talking about it being a combat government and this is at reborn of course taking a rather light-hearted view we've got an old I grandmother see. here with the ak-47 uh taking a look at some other reactions from uh, elsewhere in the globe uh the canadian channel cbc talking about how he's appointed his oh, ex segalin royale to french cabinet someone here commenting i thought a segalin royale was a french quarter pounder of course a play on the royale with cheese from Pulp Fiction. Uh, elsewhere, we've got a bit more, uh, another bit of comment here. So British journalist talking about how you should keep your enemies close and your ex-partners even closer, <laughs> uh, talking about her appointment to the cabinet. Um, a bit more serious here, another, this is another British writer. He's talking about how France has rejected the David Cameron approach. So actually focusing on what Ségolène Royale is actually going to be doing. She's an environment minister who actually believes in climate change and who gets it. So that's quite interesting. Uh, the Huffington Post has done an interesting article about the, the general reaction online. So they, and they're basically pointing out that this is indeed uh, focusing on Segal and Royale, saying the AP breaking news tweet is talking about Hollande's former partner. The New York Times, of course, has uh, dedicated 50% of its article to Ms. Royale. The Guardian has tried to cover other surprises, but of course, the ever objective Daily Mail has decided to go straight I for... I sense a tinge of irony there. Well, I mean, they've decided to go straight for the, the jugular, really. If we bring it back up to the headline, you can see what I mean. They're talking about how this is... The president has... Uh, he's nominated... Big pictures. His, it doesn't leave a lot of room for the text. Well, there. this is it. I mean, there's no <laughs> point in having any text in, really. They're talking about how this is another chapter in the president's ongoing soap opera of his love life. Um, they've been illustrating it, uh, calling the president a ladies' man. We've got other photos of uh, 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 what's her name from Amélie de Montmartre, the, the actress the film, Audrey yeah. Tattoo, uh, her meeting the president. And they've also talked about how uh, he's on the verge of finishing his affair with Julie Gaillet to spend more time with Mademoiselle Royale. It's, it's really oh focusing on the, uh, <laughs> just on the nonsense, really. And just a final piece of coverage here. This is a, a website which is talking to alternative cabinets that right. Hollande and Valls could have gone for. Uh, and this one here really is picking up on, um, you know, if he wanted some superheroes to sort out France, he could have gone for this photo. We've got Alon surrounded by Wonder Woman, Luke Skywalker, Jesus, Mother Teresa. And in the background, we do have a sneak peek of Batman, Bruce Willis, and of course, Chuck Norris. This is some of the options he could have gone for if he hadn't decided to go for his ex-partner. All right, Hala Moedin, thanks. I know that we'll be back more, with more uh, Media Watch uh, later on. Uh, let me ask on that point, uh, Pierre-Yves Le Borgne, uh, Ségolène Royal has been uh, labeled uh, by, by some as a bit of a loose cannon. Uh, how do you expect her to make an impact Just at a post which, where, I might add, uh, she already was ecology minister back in 1992? Well, she's one of the very few politicians in France who definitely master topics like sustainable development, ecology and energy. And she's definitely fit for that job and that top position in the government. I'm confident that she's going to deliver well on the energy transition that is at the very heart of the policies of François Hollande. That's an interesting point because uh, we heard her, her speech during the handover ceremony earlier. Uh, she didn't say the words 
nuclear power. She didn't say the word fracking during that during that speech. The same dilemmas that, uh, in a way, crippled on energy policy. The previous cabinet, where the Greens were part of that cabinet, still remain with the the, the, the cabinet divided. Well, the policies haven't changed. We are still on on track to transition from 75 percent nuclear uh, energy. Uh, to, to 50 percent and actually boosting uh, renewable energy and energy savings. But we heard, for instance, uh, uh, Arnaud Montebourg, uh, the, uh, 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 the um, in, a, a new economy minister, openly saying how he's in favor of fracking. Yeah, that's the position of Arnaud Montebourg himself. That is not the position of the French government, and that position hasn't changed. <laughs> All right. Well, during the we're mentioning uh, uh, Montbourg. Uh, during the past two years, um, the uh, rest of uh, Europe sometime has wondered who's in charge in that giant office building we were mentioning. Uh, the man who'll be traveling, as we said, to Brussels will be new finance minister Michel Sapin, an economic moderate close to Hollande. He'll have to contend in the same building with Arnaud Montbourg, who hails from the left of the party, whose portfolio now extends to industry and uh, economy, and who, before the cabinet had even been nominated, was engaging in some Monday morning Brussels bashing. We have the possibility of succeeding, succeeding in changing the direction in which Europe's going. Because right now, it's Europe that's dogmatically deciding on our direction, as far as austerity is concerned. When actually what we need is pragmatism and to change the Commission's ideas, which at the moment aren't brilliant. Ludovic Subran, when you speak to, to you, you talk with investors from, from the whole continent, what do they think of France? Um, they think we were a peculiar animal. And, uh, and as you can see from the, the media clips that uh, the, your journalists just show, you know, they are sometimes more interested in the love affairs and the romance that France happens than the actual you know, economic uh, policy terms. Let me just want say one thing about uh, uh, Ségolène Royal at the energy. I think it's crucial to have a transi an, an energy energy transition ministry or an environment ministry. The U.S., the success of the reindustrialization of the U.S. is also because they chose to have energy as one of the pillars of the recovery. One thing that we may not know about Ségolène Royal is that when she actually uh, was candidate in 2007 yes. for the election, mm -hmm. she was the one that first put out the idea of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, clarifying the tax mm -hmm. systems. And this is one of the ideas that actually was taken on board by uh, Jean-Marc Ayrault at the end of his, of his um, um, uh, mandate. No? So I think one of the key things that she will have to handle would be to go for green economy in a time of the business cycle which is against her. And so the financing and the eco-tax debate that we've had in France several times about the fact that it's maybe the, not the right moment to actually increase taxes to finance renewables and to subsidize renewables because we know economically it's not something that would happen only out of the private sector is something that she may actually be good at. On the economy and, and finance, just one word about this. I think Arnaud Montebourg is certainly one of these knights of the French system. He's certainly somebody who embodies a lot of the French you know, uh, image outside of France. He may not be the right one to call up all of the ministers and tell them that they actually have to cut budgets and have to revise the budgets. So that's quite good that actually François Hollande also teamed him up with, with Michel Sapin, who is known to be a consensus person, which may be more complicated. Bernard Cazeneuve was extremely good at trying to get to the crack of what was in the execution of the budget. But I think the two together, uh, could actually be a neat team. The question will be, will he be the loose cannon? I would be more worried about uh, Montbourg than I'm about Ségolène Royal. Mm. Just uh, one word about Ségolène Royal, just to remind you of what she said about François Hollande when she was campaigning against him for presidency, asking the French people just to quote one thing, only one thing that Hollande had achieved in 30 years. And now she is... But there are four because they have four kids together. That's yes, quite an of achievement. Yes, no? of <laughs> course. That's what everybody said, obviously. But you know, that says as well something quite important. All right, viewers weighing in with their uh, recipes for uh, kickstarting the French economy. Roy saying to create more jobs, raise wages, productivity, purchasing power. France must reduce bureaucracy and yes. immigration, he says. Yes. You're saying yes. 
Of course. Uh, well, I mean, emigration, maybe not. I mean, obviously, we've got to look at it very carefully. And I mean, we need some immigration, some immigration for reasons of trade. But what I'm very worried about is also all these young people leaving France. I mean, all the best French students are all leaving France because they don't feel anything to have hope. And this government is certainly not going to give them hope. You know, they want to leave. It's good for these young people to go abroad and get an experience and confront themselves with other cultures and ways of work. But this is very worrying. And I think the worries of the French people are not going to go away with this kind of government. Pierre-Yves Le Borgne? I was, uh, I was saying, I don't know whether you, you heard me, but listening to Joël saying that all talented people are leaving France and especially youngsters is just plainly wrong and you know Joël you're representing the French living yes, overseas absolutely. I'm representing the French living overseas too In Germany, you know yes. that a lot of people study abroad work abroad come back or maybe stay abroad but they don't leave the country because they do not have any future in the country for a hundred percent of them Let's be clear about that. Well, I'm sorry, Pierre-Yves. I mean, I know you're a socialist. I know what you come from. But you cannot say that these young people just hear people in the street everywhere. They tell you that the children want to go because they feel they don't have a future in France. I mean, it's sad to say. And I hope they will come back. And I represent people abroad. I think there are strengths for the country. But it is a phenomenon that we've got to be careful about. And we need to give these young people some hope. And we are not giving them hope at the moment. Y yes, we are, Joël. We oh, are. Well. We are. And, and we're looking at the cabinet that's, that, that, that's coming in, uh, Pierre-Yves Le Bon. Uh, it, it's been said, uh, you heard a minute ago, uh, uh, Ludovic Subran worry a little bit about Montebourg, not Royal, being the loose cannon in the cabinet. He said it himself. You, <laughs> the, the, the member of parliament, Pierre-Yves Le Bon, just said it also, that on fracking, for example, right. Montebourg is typically one of these guys that would actually drift away from what is the common way of understanding this. So I think he's the loose cannon. I don't know what you think, Mr. Deputy. Well, you know, to, to give you a, a bit of an anecdote, I, I was a student in Sciences Po with Arnaud Montebourg some <laughs> 25 years ago, so I, I know him well enough, and, and I know that Arnaud has a very strong personality, but he's very much a team player. And if you look at his records ever since he took office in May 2012 to what he achieved now in, in April 2014, you see a drastic change uh, in the way he, he, he conducted his responsibilities and, and what he scored as as result. So I would very much defend Arnaud Montebourg as a collective team player, in, even in if the, I happen to disagree with him sometimes. In, in, and, he, in, and he knows it. In the United States, he's known as the, the minister who scuttled the deal between Yahoo and Daily Motion. Yes. And <laughs> how do you feel about that? He's also the guy who worked very hard to save steel companies in the southwest, southeast of France. <laughs> and that's how I would like to see him, instead of only Yahoo and Daily Motion. Philip He's also a guy who is very, very conscious of the necessity and, and urge to defend French jobs in a country that has lost so many industrial jobs. Talking about records, Joël, a million jobs lost in the industry over the last 12 years during which 10 years we are yours. Yeah. Philip God, what, what, let me now. ask you, what do you prefer? Do you prefer uh, a very disciplined cabinet uh, where everyone is singing from the same hymn sheet or one that's, shall we say, more inclusive of uh, various uh, opinions? Well, I, I'm actually, well, I would prefer a more coherent cabinet, but I, I'm primarily concerned about policy rather than politics, and I'm more concerned about policy results rather than policy inputs and results rather than the personalities in government. Although I, 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 found, I found Montbull's comments about Brussels somewhat refreshing, the ones that you actually showed there, uh, because I, I, I would tend to, I would tend to, to agree with that, as, as very many American economists would and political economists would, actually. So I, I, think, I think that, you know, there's a very strong case to be made that there's something curious that has happened in Europe, which is France, which is France is Europe's second largest economic power. France is the world's fifth or sixth largest economy. It, without France, nothing in Europe works. 
And yet it appears from what has happened over the past year since 2008 and actually before that, that for all kinds of complex reasons, in fact, France has taken a behind the seats position in European policy making. And this is true under previous governments also. So, so the, 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 there's, there's a question that has to be asked as to how actually the balance of power has changed over time within Europe to put France in the somewhat defensive and peculiar position it's in. And this has to do, of course, with international relationships, the rise of German influence in Europe over time. But it also has to do with the fact that I think there was a, what the French would say, pan a, a an intellectual failure, an intellectual I failure on the part of French elites. With that. I think there, there are two things, maybe, uh, that I see that are crucial here. One is dogma, and you said it, and I think we agree on this one. The European dogma is not the one that the French have uh, actually uh, decided to go for. And, and it's a bold move. We need to go till the end of this move to prove that, you know, some of these austerity measures were wrong. The second one, and which is why the Korean cabinet makes sense, you know, you see in, in, in Italy what Renzi has achieved. I was going to say, he Italy. went for the mild reforms because he wants to build coalition. Manuel Valls will have the same challenge. He will have to gather troops. And I think what French people need is not really hope. Hope is something that you have inside. You don't wait for the governments to give you hope, but wait them to give you clarity. And in I think what in, in policies, in and, and I think what is missing right now is the clarity. We we forget things, but there were once a tax was announced and then it was withdrawn. The pack de responsabilité you mentioned it has been announced weeks ago, and now it's losing a little of its of its substance and of its anticipation effect. So I think what is really important in this cabinet is that they actually show some. I'm not you know going for an so, industrial so policy. So in, in that respect, is Manuel Valls your man? I I would say that he could be the one. That would be he's, he's got this he would a reputation be a of being he would be somebody I think what we can expect from him. I don't know him personally, but what I can see from him and what I've read from him is somebody that he would make a decision, he will not change his mind. We've had too many change of minds and change of hearts over the past years, this over the past 18 months. This is what is hampering most growth. Uh, because at the, the when you talk to companies as we do at LRMS every day, you know, people lost interest even in the taxation. They're not even interested because they don't understand anymore if it's more, less, better, how they can file for it, etc. So the lack of clarity is something that is hampering France much more than actually the dogma that we've chosen, which is quite different. I think we've chosen a model which is good. I believe in it and I'm very liberal and very neo-Keynesian. But I think we've been bad at tr conveying the message. And I think Valls could be the one to actually make sure that everybody stands in line with opinions, but in the end, in the implementation, we don't change, you know, how hard it's at the last minute. All right, so the former interior minister, a better communicator, you're saying, than his that's predecessor. His, that's his background. Uh, he started, he was the communication guy for Jospin. So he's somebody who knows what matters for the people. And like Renzi does, there are people that are gifted for this, because what people need right now is to show like a horizon, something that you can aim at, not really give you what you need, but tell you, this is where we're taking you guys. To, are you okay with that? And this is what maybe the previous government was not doing. That's the third time in this conversation we've heard about the Italian Prime Minister, 39 years of age, Matteo Renzi. On Monday, uh, throwing down the gauntlet and threatening to quit politics altogether if his bill to water down the power of the Senate fails. Um, As all the votes in the Senate will be recorded, I'll give you the names and surnames of those who want to stop the change. The people who want to stop the change are not simply those who think differently from us. Those who try to stop the change are those who, after 30 years of discussions concerning the perfect system of two-chamber legislature, say, but this isn't the real problem. I repeat, we respect others' opinions. But I believe that at a certain point, there is a duty to make a decision. Pow, Pierre-Yves Le Bon, uh, are you expecting, uh, first of all, do you have high hopes uh, from Italy's new left of center uh, prime minister who's been compared a lot the past week to Manuel Valls? Yes, I have high hopes, but as you mentioned, you know, when we started the show, he was not elected. And, and, and the that, situation is slightly different. The situation, the situation is slightly different. Uh, do you say, when you hear uh, Ludovic Subran mentioning how France has been isolated within Europe in pushing a bit more of a demand driven recipe for recovery, do you uh, say, see now Italy as a new uh, partner in crime? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And not only Italy, but one could talk also about Spain. Let's not forget that there are Europeans in Europe. And on that score, Joël Gariot-Maliam, 
the the uh, do you see this new government plus the one in Italy a counterbalance to Germany? No, not at all. I mean, Germany is now the major player in Europe. We know it, and France, unfortunately, is not at all at the same level. And you know very well even that there's Italy a decline. And, even with Italy in alliance. Even with Italy, I'm afraid it wouldn't be able to cope and resist. And we've got to accept the truth, and we've got to work with Germany, and we've got to stop attacking Germany. I mean, you know, and even on Europe aspect, I mean, I know we've got Europhobes here, but we've got to work with Europe. Europe has achieved a lot. It's not a perfect Europe. There are lots of changes to be done within Europe. But, you know, it's you cannot be so populist that you want to criticize all the time Europe. Europe has been a solid institution for us for many years. There are lots of problems. It has saved us from, from many problems. I would like to remind you of what Sarkozy has done, because, you know, the socialists spend all their time accusing Sarkozy and the UMP of terrible things. If we're in a bad situation, it's because of the right-wing government, although the situation is growing much worse since Hollande arrived in power. But that, of course, they will right. never acknowledge it. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Germany as a surplus country and the other European countries as deficit countries, or at least most of them, uh, surplus countries need deficit countries. In fact, in, in fact, if they didn't have them, yes, if they didn't have them, if they didn't have them, they wouldn't be in surplus. So, so you cannot get at the same time. It's just simply mathematically impossible to get at the same time all the European countries into surplus unless you get into beggar thy neighbor policies worldwide, uh, a global trade war between uh, uh, Europe and the rest of the world. So what I'm saying there is that German policies to 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 have been totally counterproductive in any way. The German conservative policy that but Philip, been implemented. Philip, d d the question here is, do you see Valls and Renzi as these new Tony Blair and Gerhard Schroeder of Zavira? Well, I, if, if it's Tony Blair and Gerhard Schroeder, I don't think anything is going to change, actually, because <laughs> their policies are not going to be fundamentally different than those that are present. Uh, they reformed followed. their parties. They reformed... No, well, no, but you need a fundamental, a fundamental shift European-wide to Keynesian or neo-Keynesian demand-oriented policies. Otherwise, you're going to get what people are on. You, you, you read people like Kevin O'Rourke or others right. behind the scenes. You're going to get 10 or 15 years of Japanese-style deflation and stagnation in Europe. And at that point, Europe itself would be threatened with breakup, you see. Ludovic, That's the danger. Ludovic Subran, I, I think, there isn't, these aren't the new Blairites or Schroders of, of Europe? Um, you know, Schroeder lost, lost uh, his re-election because he changed, you know, too fast Germany. I mean, we, we forget that Germany 10 years ago, 12 years ago was the sick man of Europe. But what we forget about yes. most importantly is that Germany had five years to adjust three points of deficit. We gave Italy, Spain, Portugal one year, two years at best to adjust five points of deficit. So double the speed, triple the speed. Uh, I don't think we will change Europe and we will go for a completely neo keynesian well, model. I don't think we should team up with Italy against Germany. I think there are good things to take in what Germany is doing in terms of, of attractiveness and competitiveness. There are good things to to. I'm very proud of our social capitalistic model. I'm very proud of our redistributive model. I think Italy is also proud of their, you know, industry in the north. They're proud of their way of handling, you know, many aspects of public policy that we don't know of. They're also looking at the way we handle, for example, la banque publique d'investissement. They want to do the same in Italy. They want to do the same in the UK, by the way. So I think it's just a question of best practice exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, I would take from the Germans, for example, I think, you know, it's not normal that currently in France, an employer or an employee pay the same amounts for uh, the the old age, you know, retirement type of transfers. I think part of it should be completely individual savings account. And this is something that is still very progressive in the spending, but that is important for people to reduce a little bit the cost, the burden that actually companies are paying. And this Pierre, looks liberal, Pierre -Yves Le Bon, but in the end, it's just something for economic policy that would make sense because it will tap into the savings. So there is good things right. to take everywhere right. and people can work together in trying to adjust, no? Pierre-Yves Le Bon, is it all about arbitration or is this a watershed moment where the left in southern Europe, in places like France and Italy, is going to change forever? It's a defining moment, definitely, because we all acknowledge, both in Italy and, and France, to take these two examples, that we have homework to do. We have our own issues to solve and this government, under the leadership of Manuel Valls, is definitely addressing them. 
But you know, to to come back to what Joel was saying, I would like to say that you know it is not insulting to state that maybe European policies should be challenged also. We are not attacking Europe as such, and, and Joel, you know that I campaign for the yes vote, but. We, we need to challenge competition policy if competition policy goes against the future of industries and the future of jobs in, in, in Europe and in our country, France. All right, and it's a topic we'll continue to broach in the build-up to European elections in less than two months' time. I want to thank Pierre-Yves Le Bon for joining us from Brussels, Joël Gariot melam for being with us in the studio. It was Ludovic Subran, Philip Golub, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.